Welcome to Travel Unraveled. I'm your host, Blake. Join me each month as I chat with friends, fellow world travelers, and experts of all kinds to candidly and unapologetically discuss any and everything about travel. This final episode of the year is a little unique. I appreciate all my listeners for tuning in this year. It's been a hell of a ride, that's for sure. This month's guest is a very special guest. This is an extraordinary woman I had the pleasure of meeting in 2018 in Papua New Guinea. I had the opportunity to go out with a medical mission, a wonderful nonprofit called Water Hands Hope, founded by Dr. James Ham, who is an emergency room doctor in Honolulu, Hawaii. He runs a small organization that takes teams of volunteers nurses, doctors, other professionals out to Papua New Guinea, uh, the Western Highlands region specifically, where they perform all kinds of different medical services, they create clean water projects, they provide prosthetic limbs for victims of tribal violence, uh, and many, many other great things. During that time and our trip, we partnered for the first time with another NGO called the PNG Tribal Foundation, where we met Yanam Linyana, my guest this month, who is an incredible, strong, determined, um, fiery activist, a huge advocate against gender-based violence, against sorcery-related violence, which is a huge problem in Papua New Guinea, and uh, many other social campaigns through that organization. The following is my candid Zoom conversation with Lynn. It was not intended to be a podcast. However, I think you'll find our conversation incredibly illuminating, and I hope you enjoy. Hi. Hey, Lynn, how are you? Hi. I'm very well, thank you. Yourself? I'm great. Yeah, man. It's uh, time's flying, huh? It is flying. (laughs) Awesome. I mean, when you said, let's do a Zoom, I was amazed. I'm like, oh my God, like even in Papua New Guinea, you've got Zoom now and uh, WhatsApp. I know I love. So it's amazing. We can connect from all the way across the planet right now. Yeah, so true. So, man, I have so many questions for you since, you know, a couple of years ago when I was out there. Um, Are you still with Tribal Foundation or are you working somewhere else now? I am still with Tribal Foundation, but I work with other organizations as well. So what other organizations are you working with? So there's a prison fellowship, PNG Inc., and my own organization, I mean, like, you know, just still starting off. So what, what organization did you start? So um, Prison Fellowship, Inc., uh, like What I Hands Hope. Mm-hmm. Not always, you know, there for them, but when, when I'm asked to do something, at least I'm writing some information to James. Um, and what else? My organization, my community initiative that I am planning to probably launch in, launch in 2022. Okay. Working towards that. Yeah. And other small, my friends, you know, small stuff that I, when I have time, I just go around and help them. Great. So yeah, I was going to ask, um, have you kept in touch with James and Waterhand Soap? Uh, there was a meeting that happened last week and I missed out. Last week, Saturday, I missed out. Um, and I haven't been, for this week, I, I didn't get in touch with them. And I was thinking I'm going to send a message to James today just to, you know, catch up on some things. If he's free, probably now or tomorrow, I don't know. So I'm going to do that after this, hopefully. Awesome. Yeah, I know. I've, I haven't talked to him in a bit. Um, obviously, like with COVID and everything, it's been crazy uh-huh. in America. I mean, all over the world. But yeah. um, I just imagine him being an emergency room doctor and 
I, so many nurse friends and people that I'm yeah. just kind of leaving them alone because they're so busy and stressed Absolutely. and uh, there's a lot going on here for sure. And <laughs> we have a very controversial election. I'm sure you probably know a little bit about and, you know, I, I've never been so interested in U.S. politics in my entire life than like four years ago. I was like, ah, forget about it. And then when Trump came on board, he just made everything so interesting to watch. <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Um... And it was it was kind of crazy as well because like he was so not political. Like then I was like so glued to this. Uh, the last four years of the, you know, presidency, and now it's controversial election. That's true. Absolutely. Um, so much has been going on with you. You got to travel. Tell me about like something with the Obama Foundation, and you were nominated for a big thing. What? Tell me all about that. Oh, thank you so much for asking. So, um, you know, the Obama Foundation. Mm hmm. Um, so they started when Barack Obama and Michelle Obama left the White House and they started this um, foundation basically to uh, continue their work and their passion out of the office but in the field with people and young people and communities. And so they started the inaugural Obama Foundation uh, scholarship in 2018. And then followed by, uh, I might be wrong, it might be not 2018, it might be 2017 or 2016. Uh, but then they also thought that, okay, it's so good to um, get young people from around Asia Pacific to be in this leadership program. So we should not only focus on scholars, we should focus on young people as well. So they started off with um, Obama Foundation Leaders Africa, and then they said, okay, we're gonna do one for uh, Asia Pacific. And so that was the inaugural leadership program for Asia Pacific, which, which I was part of. Out of uh, more than 5,000 applica applicants, only 200 of us were selected and three from Papua New Guinea, and I'm one of the three. Yeah, that's so incredible. So, yeah. I, I'm really proud of you. I'm, uh... I mean, I always suspected you'd be moving on, uh, you know, be beyond just the scope of your country. Um, but, you know, when we met, you had never even been out of your province, I think, or to the highlands at least. And uh, so how has it been since I last saw you just being able to travel and now having a scope of, you know, a bigger worldview, so to speak? Yes. Well... The program, the, the Asia Pacific uh, Leaders Program has really, really, and that was the first time I've left the country. The first time in my life I've actually traveled on my own without any guidance, without any tips on how to travel <laughs> out of wow. the country. Was it a little so, scary? It was scary. I left my bags, you know, my bags didn't come to the hotel with me. So I had to go after a day to get them at the airport because I dropped the... You know, there's this, um, the tags, they are attached to, to the back of your... Um, yeah, luggage tags. Yeah, luggage tags. So I dropped my my boarding pass inside uh, in Guinea when I got off in, in Malaysia. So uh, it was like, oh. But you it sorted this all out, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, they, the, the, the airport staff were very, very um, kind. And I just gave them the description of my bag and they located it for me. So it was amazing how efficient and and like that I can trust this this airport stuff. Like mm -hmm. it's not like in my country <laughs> where something you know gets lost and then you don't find it anymore. So traveling mm -hmm. out um to to the, to another country kind of opened my views well view of how things are there and how things are here and what are the similarities both countries have and then how can we maximize on what we have that is similar to you know what other countries have if we have the similarities that are present in both countries then what is the point of us not being like them you know so it like gave me ideas on how i could uh you know give more to where i'm serving yeah 
and also meeting Barack and Michelle was that. Ah. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing in itself. I mean, there are most Americans would die for that uh, that privilege. Yeah. So that's amazing. From looking at how they are leading, they're so articulate and like they embody a leadership that is needed in this time. And so many things that are happening and the differences, but they are more like you know they provide that view of how young leaders should you know not use uh, their background as an excuse but like really move forward with um, whatever that they can make out of whatever situations that they're going through so it was great to be sharing a room with the greatness of the world yeah so (laughs) how have things been politically in Papua New Guinea have has there been election I know you were posting some things about being unhappy with your government and I know you have lots of problems with corruption and and things um what's been going on locally I mean from my viewpoint as an individual the change of government that has taken place in 2017 2016 2017 is good because like back then, we we thought that the the previous prime minister was like really, really uh, like he wasn't doing things right by the books or something like that. And then when the leadership changed, and now we have a new prime minister, like we all trusted that this is going to be different, right? The 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 approach to issues, the approach to the needs of the people, service delivery is going to be different. But then we realized that it's like. It's just talk and talk and talk and there's no tangible action, you know, happening. And we're like, okay, did we make the right decision to us, the old government, and now put the new government? Was it the right decision for us that we supported? Mm -hmm. So, like, as an individual, I'm questioning, like, if really the leaders that are in in the parliament are really representing our views and our interests at heart. Because most of the things that everyone is on Facebook, you know, doing this, doing that, that, saying this, saying that. And the issues of people have been politicized, you know, like mm-hmm. if it is a, if it is a, a maternal health or if it is education, if it is health, these issues must stand alone and they must not be politicized by politicians who have interest to make, you know, benefit out of these issues. Because, for example, if you look at my, in my community, the same issue about health and education and infrastructure has been everyone who come in, we want to stand for election, say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to build up, um, you know, state-of-the-art health center here, we're going to build, start connecting your road from from another city which already connected through your community, to Port Moresby. And it's like been 45, six years now. So I'm like, no, this is, this is not happening. So the government of the day is not stable. It's not stable. Right now it's not stable. People are moving from one camp to another camp, and I don't know if that's a thing, Mm -hmm. but lately it has been a thing for the politicians to move from the government side to the opposition side, and from the opposition side to the government side. And if you look at the reasons why they are moving, only few have the interest of the people at heart. Only few. What's what's in it for me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think as uh, you get more, sort of more westernized there, and you know, those politics come, the Western politics come as well with corruption and everyone just, how can I benefit and false promises Mm -hmm. and things like that. How about um, the domestic violence front? Have you seen any changes there? Is there a change of attitude at all? Are people speaking up more? Are cases like increasing or decreasing? How has that been? That's a really great question. That's a really great question. And um, since the case, the, the case that made headlines, Janeline's case this year, since then, um, there are reports of domestic violence and as well as sorcery accusation related violence. But the reality of this report came to the news, you know, making to news outlets, making known on, on, on the internet is, is, is another thing. We may have a lot of killings going on. We may have a lot of women being abused, but it's, it, it's, not, it's not been reported in a sense that it doesn't get into the news. So how will we know that this is happening uh, or this number of cases have been 
you know, prosecute and all these number of cases have been dealt with at the police station. So it's kind of like uh, people are afraid of, of reporting, I should say. But at, in, in the background, there's a lot of issues like uh, gender-based violence. Um, for me, being attacked as well, you can see my hand. It's yeah, healing now. I'm, how are you doing? Oh, I, I, tell me tell me what happened. I mean, I really no, don't know. Blow her up. Later, we can, we can talk about it later. But sure. it's like, it's, um, I feel like there's an underlying issue that our male population should really, really address within themselves as well as our women folks as well to address within them. So like there's, there needs to be self-evaluation going on. You yeah. know, violence will not happen if you are at peace with yourself, if you are at harmony with yourself and, and who you are as a person and the purpose and, and everything about you, your dreams, your goals, your life. You know, you get your life together, you wouldn't be angry at some other people. You wouldn't be standing like, in a in a public place trying to harass women, you know. So it's something to do with individual, like an individual. Really sitting down, really understanding oneself, coming to terms with, okay, I'm at this stage, I am broke, but I have these skills and I can do better and I can reach out to people who can help me. Like we are not thinking in that sense. We are we are accepting where we are as as that is. That's it that this is where I'm supposed to be and this is where I'm supposed to be and I'm supposed to be robbing people all my life and then that's it. I'm supposed to just steal from people and then that's it. Every time I'm angry, I'm supposed to just lash out at, at my wife and my kids violently and that's it. There's no ways we are sitting down with ourselves, having yeah. that conversation with ourselves fed, okay, why am I angry all the time? There's one thing she says, it upsets me, but probably she's saying it in a more intentional way. She's meaning good, but I'm taking it in a wrong way because there's something wrong with me inside me and I need to fix that. We can, I can go and talk about stopping gender-based violence. Oh, it's wrong, it's against the law and all of that. But if we cannot go to the level that the person is coming from, mm -hmm. go down to their level, sitting down with them, okay, why are you upset, always upset? Why are you always screaming at your wife? Why are you always lashing out in physical violence? Why is that? Because every time you are doing this, what is wrong? Tell me what is wrong. So yes, programming the individual. Exactly. And there's so many broken people. There's so many broken people in Papua New Guinea. So many broken people. Why I say this is because I can refer back to like what, how I grew up you know, and how my mom and dad provided that uh, uh, conducive environment for me to grow up believing in myself and them believing in me. That kind of environment is not being produced by most parents and they don't understand the implications of what kind of environment they produce that will, you know, the, the kids will grow up learning from. So I feel like there's like, there needs to be a huge flip, you know, to this gender-based discuss violence discussion, this social racism violence discussion. Like, if we continue to say, oh, the law says this, the law says that you, you shouldn't bash your wife up, you shouldn't do this, the law says this. But then we are not going to, to solve it because we are not dealing with the person who is angry. Mm. We are just trying to push down the law down their throat and then not getting to... to settle them yeah we, we are not killing them like and then he will still be angry because it's not the law it's just there's something that is going on within himself that he needs to the demon inside him he needs to tame that and then like come out being a peaceful person so most of the time the approach that we are taking in addressing gender-based violence is i sometimes feel like it's so wrong like not wrong but <laughs> we need to re redo this whatever process approaches we are taking in a way that now we focus on individual like we focus on an individual mental health resources absolutely mental health um um you know parental responsibilities um talking about values-based programs that are focused on building someone in a way that they grow up with these principles and 
so tiring, but then there's something that we need to do. So like change that, that the discussion and the approaches that we are taking to address gender-based violence in our country. Because there's so many things, so many money we have spent as a government, as an NGO, as international organizations, as development partners, but yet we are achieving like uh, not achieving the the result that we aim to achieve. Like it's sometimes less, is sometimes less than less, and statistics keeps on increasing. So that means that whatever approach that we are taking is not working. So we need to change it. The important thing is that you are addressing and and fighting it one way or another, um, you know, because yes. there there are people standing up for it. It's just it's not easy to reprogram uh, you know, what, what we've been conditioned to say is acceptable in society, and then to not cast blame. You know, mm. that's like you said, is going to anger people more. It's yeah. To to get them to change, I mean, somewhat they have to do it themselves. So how do we rehabilitate people to mm, know mm, that mm. this is morally wrong and this is not mm. something that uh, should be tolerated? But uh, God, I know it's so difficult. Do you think when I was there, I noticed sort of the initial impacts of technology really just getting there for you? Do you think that leads to more violence, sort of the now people want more? They want new phones and they want clothing and they want possessions and things that they never cared about before. And then there's more envy. And is that a part of it too, do you think? Um, they'll, I'll say there's a yes and a no, and I'll explain the answers. So yes, meaning in, in towns and cities it's happening like people are materializing like they are more focused on material things and and trying to trying to be up to this trendy stuff and not really trying to take um responsibility on how they view things uh, in a different way meaning like on the street if i walk down the street and i have really nice clothes i am dressed up for to go get something and people think that I have like lots of money, right? So they view me in a different way. They're, okay, she's wearing a nice shoe, she's wearing clean clothes, she probably has thousand kina in her in her pocket right now. So let's go rob her. Mm -hmm. So there's no meaning or no thought towards decency, like just public decency, like or individual decency, how we talk, how we dress, how we portray ourselves in the public. It can attract violence towards us or not so in, the, in that sense it's happening like this violence and also caused by intern, uh, uh, technology as well there's a, there was a, uh, an incident last time where a woman did a duet tiktok duet with um there's a particular feature on tiktok where you can do a duet but not really together you probably telling that person let's plan to do a duet but then you just find a single mm -hmm. single tiktok online and you want to do a duet on 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 that so she did that duet on on someone someone's um tiktok video online and she got best out by her husband for it because her husband thought that oh this is like you know really these people are really communicating and trying to do Jealousy. something and yeah. then it's it's a it's a feature on TikTok that you could I could be here and you could be in 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 where you are now and then whatever uh, video that you have produced on TikTok that's that's following a kind of like a storyline and I could react to it, you know. He didn't understand the use of of that particular feature and so he thought that oh there's actually communication going on between these two and they're probably doing something you know outside of whatever you know our marriage and all of that so. It was a really, it was a big headline, and I hope that this man was dealt with because he represented a very big football. Is uh, a part of a team that plays uh, rugby, and she's also an athlete. So I hope they probably solve the issue already or not. I have to check that one out, but it's um, it's an issue when half of the population are not half of the population, probably sixty or 
70%, 80% of the population are illiterate and they don't know the use of Facebook, social media. And then if I go comment on someone else's photo and then they think that I'm already, you know, <laughs> doing something with that person. Like, in, uh, there's, there needs to be a wide social media education awareness. Right, but you're saying and, these people and, don't even know how to read and write, so they're expected yeah. to understand and advance technology immediately yeah. because it's available now. And yeah, yeah. yeah and now, do you have? Because this is a big problem in the United States. Have you noticed, or do people talk about at all, um, misinformation online, where say someone posts something to Facebook that's not true, but everyone believes it? for one reason or another and a rumor starts and then something bad happens yeah. with something yeah. that's completely not true. Yeah. Huge misinformation. Recently, recent, just recently, probably one week ago, I posted something about, okay, if I take a selfie with the prime minister or any other, you know, prominent leader or member for that matter, and I, I, I try to, I decide to post this selfie on, on any social media, and people will just take it out of context. People who are not supporting whoever person that I'm taking a selfie with, they will take it out of context and think that I'm, a, I'm, you know, doing this and that to that person, you know, in in a. So one of the lady did that. She took a selfie with the the prime minister, the current prime minister. She posted it on Facebook, and someone totally took the picture out of context and then said, "Okay, this lady is sleeping with him." Something like that. It was so totally out of context because this, this was just a woman, just a woman and a staff taking a selfie with the prime minister and posting it. And it was so, so, so misinformation. It happens, especially when we are talking about politics. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about politics in the country, there's people who are supporting the opposition and people who are supporting the um, government. And also there's people who are supporting the government because their favorite politician is in the government side. They're supporting the opposition because their favorite MP is on the opposition side. There's so many misinformation going on. One side of the party is saying we're doing this, 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 and that. The other side of the party is doing we're this, doing this, 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 and that. And taking each other to court and trying to battle over something called misinformation or, mm -hmm. you know, rumors and all of that. More money is being wasted on these things than services reaching our communities. Um, yeah, educating people and healthcare and, and uh, yeah, things you need. And, and also when it comes to the development space, um, like in an in a, in area of working as an in the NGO sector, the international development sector, most of the bad, if I, I may say, that have been generated are not inclusive of the people who don't know how to read and write. Yeah. And these are the majority. Majority do not know how to read and write, up to 70%. So the people that give responses to surveys and all of that, it's based on who knows how to read and write. And sometimes because of their, their um, loyalty to a particular a person that is trying to collect information, their, their views may be biased. It is important that the 80%, the views from the 80% population is 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 captured in whatever data that is being collected and so i think that if if they miss out then whatever we are trying to make out of the data we are collecting if the data is 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 being generalized to say that Papua New Guineans think this way then it's it's false yeah. because we haven't gotten the 80 percent or 90 percent of the population's wow. idea in in there so that's also a big issue when it comes to development in a country and Papua New Guinea always being referred to as a oh, poverty-stricken country. Uh, it's gender-based violence is a norm, you know. But I believe like GBV is happening in 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 towns and cities where people are being affected by unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's so many factors that are present in towns and cities that really, really uh, help as a catalyst to them being being violent, like, you know, alcohol, drug, yeah. um, they have access to internet, and like, 
access to you know sites that are not they're not supposed to be there and spending their time there and all of this it gives them ideas on how you know they want to do something to someone so it's so different in the urban area than in the rural area the rural areas they're really really taking care of their women and girls and their their wives and kids so it comes to if if it's if a, if a data is being generalized and said uh, and states that PNG men are violent, it's, it's totally not true, because most of these men are living in rural areas. Yeah. So you are just saying that say twenty percent, even twenty percent, they're um, they're not violent. There's so many men who are, who have grown up in the village, and who have so much value. So. Yeah, there's so many misinformation in the reports that have been produced in how PNG has been portrayed at the international international uh, stage. And even though we may lack um, services in our communities, people are really like rural people, village people are really resilient. You know, how can one survive without being to a medical clinic for more than 70, 80 years? You know, these people have survived on their own, have consulted the environment for herbal medicine whatnot they have survived off the land yeah you are very in, in tune with the land as a people yeah and yeah so it's yeah there's so many things that are i feel like there's so many misinformation about Papua New Guinea, both in the politics as well as pngs general in terms of gender-based violence and social acquisition related violence especially gender-based violence. So all, not all men are violent. There's just 5% of the population there are, they, they are still violent. And if we can prove that, then we need to have like data coming from everyone in every community, every villages to prove that PNG is actually not very violent. It's just some people who are uncultured, sorry, uh, who, <laughs> who have no values, um, who, do not have a moral compass in the society who are doing this and we should target these people and try to settle them down and regarding sorcery is that kind of this at the same level it was when we last spoke or has that been declining a little or increasing uh, there was a, a um assumption that was made by some of the people who are fighting in this space of sorcery like um our root kizam yeah, I remember um, Ruth. And, um, and um, Anton Lutz and some of the people who are doing research around sorcery that with COVID-19 and and sw the African swine flu that have hit our, the highlands of Papua New Guinea because of a lot of pigs, that's caused by this two, two, two pandemic. It's going to cause a lot of women to die because then people are just dying. Hospitals are not readily accessible and so the cause of that will not be identified mm -hmm. and then people just assume that they have been killed by sorcerers. So to this day uh, to this date um we haven't really experienced uh any death related to COVID. We we only had cases but we haven't really experienced any death related to COVID. The last person who died was, he, they didn't die of COVID. They d died of a different illness and they put it out of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still killings happening in the, in the villages. And the only thing that is missing is it's not being reported. And pe so people we, are using are, the, the unseen illnesses as a way to say, oh, that must have been sorcery because what else could it be? Yeah, because people are not... Also, if someone dies, and if people say that it's they've died of sorcery, if the hospital wants to do postmortem, like mm -hmm. an autopsy, just, yeah, autopsy. Sorry, autopsy and identify what's the cause of the death. People don't allow that. They say you're disrespecting the dead body, mm -hmm. and we just go and bury that person without finding out why he or she died. So it's so like hard when people are standing against the process of identifying the cause of that. And now, then, is that yeah. being protected by the tribal leaders or is that being protected by the government or both? You mean 
saying, oh, we're not going to do an autopsy, like we're just going to bury the body. Is that the local tribal leaders that kind of sway that to be accepted? Sometimes it's like government is straightforward, right? It's, it's a law. Like if, if I want to identify and health, health hospitals are a government, you know, um, you know, serving us in the community. So whatever the hospitals say, that means that it's sanctioned by the government for them to say, okay, we do an autopsy on a body. So most of the time, the the decision or the suggestion is always pushed aside by the people who are actually the ones leading violence against this, you know, marginalized women in the community because they have this interest that we don't want you yeah. to identify the, the cause of the death because we want this woman gone. We want mm -hmm. this woman in the village gone and for no good reason. So don't do it. So they have, you know, self-interest in there. And sometimes it's not sanctioned by the community leaders. It's basically mob violence, you know, mob mm -hmm. thinking. So they come in, sometimes it's, it's dangerous for uh, uh, Dr. Ranes to stand in the way, you know. Yeah, people, people are afraid to, to stand up yeah. against the mob. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very hard situation. Um, so if you don't mind sharing and if you don't want to talk about it, by all means, you don't have to. But wh what exactly happened with you and your arm? And are you okay, first of all? Like, are you, are you I am doing? Very, I am very well. You can see. So they did... Yeah, stitch from here all the way to here. Um, I was one month ago, 26th of October, I was walking home from work and I usually catch bus always. So our organization doesn't have a car. So I live in a area where it's when it's weekend, when it's like going in the afternoon, the like curfew is like at six o'clock, five o'clock because it's not really safe outside. So I was on my way after work and I had to stay a little bit up to four, five o'clock because I was just trying to get some things together for uh, a festival that we were hosting up in um, Enga. So after that, I walked down to the bus and I catch bus two times. So I got on a bus that was gonna drop me off at that bus stop that I'm gonna change bus and then come to the house. I got on a bus, walked, no nothing, like I did, that's, I've been walking through the same road for the past three years, you know, so like so confidently, and that day I dressed really nicely, because I had meetings with very important stakeholders, mm -hmm. so I tucked in my uh, t-shirt into my skirt, wore a really nice uh, sandal, and that was it, I looked very bright that day, I should say, so afternoon, I walked and I carried a little small bag as well. Walked to the bus stop, got on the bus, came, changed the bus, and then I was already sitting inside the bus that was heading towards home. And this young man out of nowhere came in to the bus, aimed me. He didn't come in without any, like, he wasn't confused on who is going to rob. Mm -hmm. he, he knew who he was going to rob. So he came straight to me got my bag and started pulling at my bag. Hey, give me your bag. And I was like, no, I'm not going to give you my bag. So I stood up to him and he was surprised that I stood up to him. But I, I think he was he was doing it in in partnership, in collaboration with some other thugs that were stand, standing outside the bus. So he walked in, he pulled at my bag. Uh, I didn't want to let go of my bag because most of the time I've been letting go of my bag two tugs and I was I was tired of letting go of this one so I was like I'm gonna stand up to a fight and if I die today it's okay because you know probably my story will try to be a catalyst for change in these communities where leaders are just their priorities are so misplaced that they are not creating opportunities for young people like this yeah so, you're, a, you're a fighter by nature I understand <laughs> so I fought back and then he was surprised that I fought back he's a really tiny guy uh, probably he was doing drugs and his eyes you could see so red uh, and then probably someone outside handed him a machete so this is a machete probably 30 centimeter long yeah or yeah it looked like 40 50 centimeter long and he um 
he just he just threw the knife at me like he was trying to cut a a, a stick or a, something. You know, he threw it intentionally. You know, when you want to cut something, you threw a machete, you threw a knife intentionally at something in order for you to cut that thing or a stick or whatever that you are trying to cut. So he did that, and I was like, I didn't I didn't recognize that it was a machete at the at first. I thought it was a stick or an iron. But I could see the machete coming towards my face. It didn't land on my face or my neck somehow. And it landed on my arm, uh, my left arm, because on my left arm, I was holding my bag. And on my right arm, I was trying to fight off this guy. So he thought, oh, I'm going to let my bag go because, you know, my hand is hurt. But he didn't. So I started screaming, and then everyone came to my rescue. But before that, no one helped. Like, there were like one, five, 15 people already sitting in the bus and about 10 or 20 people standing outside in the public area. And no one did nothing. So I was like, I so helpless. I was like, so hopeless, helpless. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. That's yeah. so terrifying. So it was like crazy. I was like, oh my God. If I die today, it's okay, though. So I'm like, I'm not going to give you my bag. I'm so sorry. But if he got my bag, it would have been for 50 cents wow. or 25 cents. Because that was the only money I had in the bag to pay for bus fare back home. So did he run off at this point? Or did people pull him off? or the, When I started screaming, the driver and the bus crew had me. And they came they came in, they, all of them tried to help me. But then it was too late because my hand was slashed already. And they manhandled this man probably for one minute and he was gone. Probably he was gone or he, I don't know. So then I realized that my hand was literally hanging down because two tendons were cut off. Oh. Tendons to this one and to this one was like slashed off. So I couldn't hold anything. My bag was, you know, coming off my um, hand, grip. I was losing grip of my bag. I'm like, okay, what is happening with my bag? My hand is okay. Why is my the handle of my bag leaving, you know, my hand? And when I look down, you could see like fresh cuts. You will see the white blood plasma. Is it called white blood plasma? Yeah. 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 White blood plasma. Then I realized that there was like the blood is going to come anytime soon. So I was like, oh, I need to go to the hospital. First, the first words that came out of my mouth was, I forgive you, whoever you are. I just I just shouted it out of the bus and said, I forgive you, whoever you are, but I need to go to the hospital. And I said, I need to go to the hospital five times, and no one in the bus responded. And blood started pouring out my hand. Wow. And then everyone realized that, oh, my goodness, her hand is slashed. So someone handed me an handkerchief. I tied it right around the um, the place that was splashed, and then put pressure on the on on the wound, and jumped off the bus, fully knowing that he's probably walking around with the machete around the bus. Wow! Or not, I took the risk to step out of the bus <laughs> straight to the uh, taxi and ask the driver if if he could speed me to the hospital. And then uh, the driver said, do you have money? I'm like, what the heck? I am injured. Unbelievable. Can you, wow. just, can you just bring me to the hospital? You will still get your money. And I was like, ask the second time, do you have money for bus? I mean, for taxi. I'm like, just go. I was so angry. and But I couldn't speak strongly because if I speak, if I spoke strongly, the blood's going to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be a lot of blood. How far were you from a hospital? Uh, it was ten minutes ride. I ten mean, minutes which is a ride. Long time when you're you're bleeding from your arm. Yeah, but it, it, thank God that they tie this thing around my my my. Uh, like a yeah, like a tourniquet. Yeah, around my wound, and it held a lot of blood. Mm -hmm. so if it was open, I would have passed out. Yeah. and couldn't hold my hand like this to to hold the blood. So the moment I stood out of, uh, stepped out of the bus, I was already feeling dizzy. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to stay in around these days. I'm going to find a way to go to the hospital. And no one helped me. 
I begged this elder guy to, to escort me to the taxi. He was afraid of his life as well. I'm like, I understand, but don't show that don't show that you are a masculine person. Just show that you are weak and, you know, we already got hurt and we're just trying to make our way to the hospital. So I was so angry, but then I was like, okay, I'm not angry at this young person. I am so sorry that he's yet to realize his potential to be a good person. So I was like, I forgive you. That was the first words that come, came out of my mouth. I think that was the first, that was the thing that helped me, is helping me heal faster because I'm not holding grudges against this young man. Um, yeah, that, so, says, that says a lot about you and your character. I mean, to not harbor anger and hate for someone. So you, you had surgery. I know I saw you posted. And what, what do they say? How is your healing going? And So I, I'm not able to fold all of my fingers yet mm -hmm. because it's been in, in, the, in sling for the past one month. But the doctor said... Um, I can be able to, after three to four months, I can be able to fully use my hand. Make a fist or, yeah. yeah like this. Yeah. Yeah. Tendons were cut, you said? It was cut. It was like totally slashed. And so you don't want to see the, you don't want to see the pictures. It's, it's so, you, you'll have nightmares. Are you going to have function of your thumb or is that gone? I can, see, I can. I can do it. Okay, so that's that's good. It's not a complete loss of function. No, it's not a complete loss of function. I can. I was wow. scared. Man, that is terrifying. I mean, I, it's terrifying just for me to hear across a computer screen. Um, terrifying. I'm, I'm really, was, really happy you're okay. It was terrifying. I didn't really have the time to just sit down with myself and try to process this whole trauma. I'm still like, I'm not, I'm not okay walking around in public places. I'm like, I am not. And I feel safer driving in dark tinted glass than driving in an open light, open screen taxi. I'm not okay still. And, um, and that's, and that's okay. I mean, it is going to take a long, long time to be okay with the, you know, the trauma you went through and it, that will happen with time and you will, there's no rush to heal mentally as well as, but you're still recovering physically. Yeah. Dealing with a trauma and, you know, mentally certain things can trigger it, you know, randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, True. And that, that's all normal. So I'm sorry, really sorry you have to go through that, but um you're Thank a survivor. You. I mean, you're you're a strong person. So let yourself heal in time, and you're gonna be you're gonna be fine. You'll be stronger in the end, I'm sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, is, did this guy just get away scot free, or did the police ever find him? He got away. He got away, and I'm just hoping that when my hand heals, I'm going to go just look for him. Not to bring him to the police, not to prosecute him, but I want to introduce him to this amazing organization called City Mission. So it's a it's an NGO that's taking in young people, men, mm -hmm. especially men, training them to become good members of the society and then making them employable. You know, mm -hmm. that's my plan, but I just need my hand to heal and then I can do that. Hopefully I can identify him again. I'll, I'll recognize him. And go with some protection just in case he gets oh, yes, violent. Definitely. Again. Definitely. I'll go with some <laughs> protection. I'll go with the Ninja Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ninja in paradise, right? <laughs> yes. But not really paradise. I realized. Well, uh, yeah. It's all relative, right? Yeah. And what about Senis and Pasin? Are you still screening and doing that, or is that done? I am still screening and doing that. Um, so I really have really great plans. We Did you know we have changed in leadership? No. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth is not the director of operations anymore. New director of operations, um, and she left us. She resigned. 
Oh, Ruth resigned? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what trouble will do, stay or go, but seven months is, from now until seven months, I'm still with travel until then. Oh, and oh then so you, you only have seven more months with them, you're saying? Yeah. And then you're on to your own project and your own thing. No, own of probably other. Co collaborating, on, yeah. Yeah, other organizations. Well, that's good. I mean, you're, yeah, you're, like, yeah. you're you're still very, very young. And I think, you know, you have a lot to, uh, the more you can see and do, the more you're going to learn and the, the better advocate you're going to be. Yeah. So I'm really thinking um, about applying for <laughs> my um, post-grad, for my master's. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Just working towards... Exiting. Would you try and do that in, in Papua New Guinea or would you try and go internationally somewhere? Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. If there's ever any uh, any help you need, don't hesitate to reach out and I can, uh, I'd be happy to research and, you know, talk to professors and use any resources I have because I still Thank keep you. in touch with some old college people and, um, yeah, I think there's nothing better than to educate yourself as much as you can, so. Thank you. Yeah, well, hey, I, won't, I won't keep any longer. I know you're on your lunch break and I'm uh, about to make some dinner. I made some chicken uh, for my girlfriend and I. All right. Um, but it was so nice catching up with you and I'm glad you. you're you're healing and you're okay and you're doing well. Um, and I'm happy you're still advocating and fighting and doing all the great work that you do. Thank you so much. That concludes my conversation with the amazing Yanam Lin Yana, a.k.a. Lin. Thank you so much for agreeing to be my guest. I know that wasn't our original intention, but I'm so happy to share our conversation, um, your struggles and your passions with the rest of my listeners. For more information on what's happening in Papua New Guinea, I strongly encourage you to go to two websites. The first waterhandshope.org, which is the organization I was able to volunteer with, and also pngtribe.org. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of 2020. I know it's been a tough year, but I'm wishing everyone the best in 2021. Thanks for tuning in.